My friends, if we ever expect to be found worthy and deserving of inheriting a better realm, a better world, then what we need to do is we need to understand there are certain requirements. And one of them is that we care about our fellow human beings. By not caring about them, you're proving yourself basically to be evil. When Jesus said, whatsoever we do or fail to do for the least of men, we do or fail to do for him. Now a child can understand that logic. So whoever in your mind you consider to be the least of among men, okay, you personally, individually, need to care about them. And if everybody else in the whole world is just say, you know, has a laissez-faire attitude toward the problems of other men, you know, it's their problem, they're on their own, it's, you know, tough noogies for them. Well, and you know what? Maybe God turns out to be just like you when it comes to caring about you and where you go from here, what your reality is going to be like. If you say it's okay and, you know, not my problem and what can I do about it, but really you don't ever ponder and you don't ever use your God-given ability to think and, and imagine solutions to our problems and a better world and, and work toward creating a better, more civilized society. We call this a civilized society. It's nothing but madness. The whole entire civilization is rife with madness to this day. What do you think God thinks? Put yourself in God's position. Imagine you're the almighty creator God. It, it, what do you think God's threatened by that? thought? Not at all. He wants us to do that, to see through his eyes. And that way we can we can represent him properly and say, wow, you know, it sure looks different from up here. You know, the what he wants and, and the way we're the direction we're going. So, I mean, these new commandments are by the spirit, man. I mean, you love God above all else. Of course you do, because it's the most he's got the power of life. Do you understand? He's the one that decides where our very souls go from here. He owns your very body. He's the one that gave you life and existence and the ability to do everything you've ever accomplished or achieved in your life. He's the one that gave it to you and, and did it for you. And so that makes perfect sense. The first commandment is to follow that. It's like falling off a log. It's super easy. And the second one, he said, is just like it. It's just as easy. Is love each other the way he has proven that he loved us. An undying love, an amazing grace. So we've got to show that and treat others like brothers and sisters as to the best of our ability. Really care. That's proof that we really love. They're doing tangible things, the way we think about other people. <laughs> the way we speak about other people, the least of men, remember, and what we do or do fail to do for them. You know, I mean, let's take that $50 billion a year on Section 8 housing and just buy people houses. For God's sake, solve the freaking problem. You know, but so many people would be up in arms. Oh, how dare you suggest such a liberal thing? And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm a logical, fiscal conservative. I want you to have lower taxes. I want you to have a lower cost of living because, I mean, if it's a cost of living, okay, it's by default, it's a tax. Call it what you want. It walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's a duck. If you got to pay it in order to keep living, well, it's as onerous as any possible tax. So why isn't the cost of living considered a tax? It is a tax. So I want you to have lower taxes. I want you to have a lower cost of living. I want problems solved, and I know there's solutions. So I'm a very passionate but frustrated guy because I know there's solutions to all of our problems, all the invented artificial problems and all the organic problems. Okay, there's solutions. Use your God-given imagination. You can fix anything you don't like, anything that bugs you, anything that's problematic is fixable. If you turn to God, say, God, well, I don't see any solution here. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. Seek, and you shall find. Guaranteed. This much faith. Itty bitty, barely see it. That's all you need. That's it, man. He loves you. You're, you're equally beloved child of God. You're a human being. You're a very special creature. We're very unique from all the other creatures out there. Very unique.
That's because we're made in the image and likeness of God. With this imagination that knows no bounds, virtually inexhaustible imagination. The sky is the limit. If you can imagine it, it can be brought into fruition. All right. My thoughts have been catching up on me, so I decided to um, insert a third tape so that I could try to get through some of these thoughts and get caught up. While certainly it is true that there exist many people whom genuinely, genuinely love us, some to the point of being willing to die for us, <coughs> and we may be among those people. It is also true that there exists another of infinitely greater import than any mere human being, any person that loves us in a way that loves us in a way we cannot touch. That is the Almighty Creator God of the universe and all contained therein. That is our very owner, our divine parents. We are the pottery. And he and she are the potters. We are the owned, and he and she are the owners. It is certainly a beautiful thing when one piece of pottery loves another piece of pottery. But how infinitely more beautiful when the potter is willing to die to save his and her pottery. The owner willing to die for his and her owned and that is an example of God's eternal, inexhaustible, almighty love for us all. God, through Christ, proved this incomprehensibly profound truth, this unfathomable love, when he died for us all, merciless, mercilessly on the cross, and rose up for us. Right. Thereby showing... That ultimately, God has that power and authority and ability, okay, to give us a new life. That this thing that we all lament over called death doesn't really exist. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Just like the lie from the pit of hell that's constantly chattering in our ears telling us, you can't solve your problems. Your humanity is hopelessly divided. You'll never come together, right? That's demonic. That's what we're listening to. Okay, that's a big fat lie from the pit of hell to say that we can't all learn to live together in peace and harmony and safety and security, freedom and prosperity and all those good things that we all want. Who can deny we all want those basic things and all the creature comforts and all that stuff? God wants us to have it all and we can have it all. Yes, we can have our cake and eat it too according to the scriptures. It's a thus saith the Lord thing. Okay, the system would work fine. Okay, if we were letting God guide us, we could all be born rich, born wealthy, born prosperous, and that having nothing to do with any form of money at all. Okay, that's it. That's the reality. Use your brain. Okay, God built in you a fail-safe, an in unstoppable urge to be appreciated okay to contribute it's just as natural as the day is long we must nothing can stop us we want to be part of this thing i mean you're given everything from birth all this accumulated technology is all yours if we shared stuff, there's so much, there's such an excess, we could have extra houses all over the world. There's with these seven plus billion people. Well, why if we all want three houses, let's just build twenty one billion homes. Duh. I mean there's solutions to everything. We can learn to live together in peace and harmony, and safety, security. We can get along with each other. To suggest otherwise is a big fat lie from hell, okay? Of course God cares about even seemingly small matters in our lives. After all, like an appendage, we humans are literal extensions of God. Yeah, I mean, God isn't like some faraway distant, ooh, God in the heavens, and, you know, will he ever poke his head through the clouds and reveal himself? No, God is with you, man. God is described as, as spirit in Scripture. Basically, God is whatever God wants to be. 
And God certainly wants to be in us, live through us. And he's a very generous God because he owns everything. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, you would too if you owned everything with your kids. You wouldn't withhold anything from them, make them so well. I own everything, and I know I could alleviate their pain and suffering just by letting, sharing with them and, you know, giving them, let's say, God used money. So I, I'll withhold the money and make them suffer, and I get a kick out. He'd be a sadistic you-know-what, a-hole. And that, uh, you wouldn't want anything to do with a God like that. So everything about God is logical and reasonable to assume. Okay. It all makes perfect sense in the realm of divinity and our destiny. I mean, this cosmic tapestry, this, this, this merry-go-round we call human existence, we can't get off it. We can get new bodies, and that's the prediction. That's the prophecy. You get a new imperishable body. Yes, we all must be born again. We all know, scientifically speaking even, we got to relinquish this flesh and blood body. But God is fully capable. It takes this much faith to believe. He can give you an, an acutely, atomically superior body, okay, that cannot be harmed, cannot get diseases, cannot perish, basically. It doesn't take much faith. I mean, use your imagination. How would you build it? How would you do it? Some would argue, well, wait a minute, even if there's no diseases or predators, you could still fall off a mountain, a cliff, and die because of gravity. Well, th then think of a solution to that. Maybe gravity is not as powerful, as harsh as it is now. And so you're not going to fly, you know, you're not going to be so little gravity that you float off into space, but uh, it won't be harsh enough to harm you. You understand if you fell off a cliff. But God is not a distant God. He's right there with you. I mean, the Holy Spirit of truth is there. It's, we have equal access. It's like an umbilical cord that God wants us to turn to him and for advice and counsel, for the right opinions and belief systems and all that stuff. You know, just to, like you're talking to a friend. I mean, you think about God. You're not maybe talking out loud. People might think that's a little strange. But you're thinking about that relationship you're talking about like a friend and inviting him into every aspect of your life laying it out there you know the good the bad and the in between everything everything he cares about you he cares about me he cares about all of us i need to remind myself because i can beat myself up i can i can really make myself miserable if uh, i feel like i deserve to be made miserable but, uh, you know I, I feel like i'm metaphorically trying to slash my wrists like self-flagellation sometimes it's like, why can't I be happy? I, I mean, I'm enjoying my life. I've got a great life. Every reason in the world to be happy 24 hours a day. But yet, you know, I find ways to nix it. And, uh, you know, it just, it's just this struggle between the, the, uh, the secular, worldly, carnal, flesh man, the base man, battling with the spiritual man. You know, one wants one thing and one wants the other thing. And we all experience this thing. In 12-step programs, they refer to this as terminal uniqueness. Scripture would call it sin, the sinful nature. But um, it's not unique to us. We're all like that, that, you know, we don't understand all of our thinking and all of our speech and all of our behavior. And we need God to help explain to us what's going on. And he does care. We're extensions of him, just like children, you could say, are extensions of their parents. They came forth from the womb. And, uh, you know, the woman didn't do it on her own, generally speaking, except for the case of Jesus. But, um, you know, but, uh, God is real, and we're part of this whole cosmic tapestry. And in light of the fact that there's no way to get off this merry-go-round because there is no death, so... You, you can't die in the sense of ever not existing anymore. You're going to, one way or another, you're going to have to go forever. So you either you got to decide where you're going from here. Make sure you please your owner. Make sure you're following these two commandments. Okay? And if you do, I mean, God's not tricky. It's not like he's hard to discover his will for you, how he wants you to think, how he wants you to speak, what he wants you to do. It's not a mystery. It's not a secret. Quite the contrary is true. So, you know, we're all without excuse for not doing it. We've all got to do our level best to be the people that he wants us to be. 
to be as likable as we possibly can, to influence people in a very positive way, trying to win friends for them and, and, and make sure you let people know their value because we live in a world that can beat the crap out of your value, make you feel like you're just another warm body and you ought to just go climb under a bridge and die, do the earth a favor, right? Isn't that the prevailing thinking? Is a, you're, a bad, you're bad for the earth. So if you want to do help the big picture, you know, stop heating and cooling your house, stop driving your car, stop burning carbon, stop having any carbon footprint at all. That's the ultimate thing you can do, which means you got to die. You got to stop existing. You got to stop, you know, stop caring about survival.